ask you, do you know why you're here? No, I don't. Do you have any idea why you're here? No, I don't. Okay, well, we're working on an investigation, and uh, there's a warrant for your arrest uh, charging a count of murder. Count of murder? Yes, sir. So, uh, before we get into it, I know I can see right by your expression, you've got a lot of questions to ask us. Right. We've got a couple to ask you, too. Okay. I'm sure you've seen this on TV a thousand times. I've got to advise you, and then we'll talk about it man to man here. And okay. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. You have the right to remain silent. Do you understand that? Yes. Anything you say may be used against you in court. Do you understand? Yes. You have the right to the presence of an attorney before and during any questioning. Do you understand that? Yes. You want to sit here and talk to us uh, about that? I don't even know what it's about. You know? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, here, I forgot. If you uh, cannot afford an attorney, you want to be appointed for you free of charge for questioning. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. So, uh, you want to sit here and talk about the uh, warrant? Yes. And what the charges are against yes. you? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We have been uh, investigating a murder that occurred in uh, 2007. Okay? And it involves a young lady. And I'm going to ask you, show you a photograph of this young lady and see if you recognize her. Never seen that girl before. No, I haven't. Who is that? Is that Peters? Yes. All right. No, I haven't. Okay. okay. Uh, like I said, we've been investigating this since 2007, mm -hmm. and uh, um, you're not down here. We didn't just pick your name out of a hat. I mean, I, you watch all these little mm -hmm. police shows and CSIs and and all that stuff with modern technologies and all that. All right. Okay, well, you've been identified to this young lady. Okay. Okay, do you understand that? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you have any questions about that? Why would you be uh, identified? I don't know. I, I don't know. I know a lot of people, but I don't know her. Okay. All right. So do you know how the, I'm sure you've probably uh, heard about DNA. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, your DNA was identified uh, in relation to You're telling me, so that's all I can, yeah, that's all I can say. How could that happen? I don't know. You have no idea? I have no idea. You've never seen this lady before? No, I haven't. In your life? No, I haven't. Do you have anything you want to ask about her? No. Okay, in 2003, this young lady was found killed. Have you ever seen her? No, I haven't. You don't know that lady? No, I don't. You've never seen her? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Mr. Franklin, just like the other one, your DNA was found on this young lady. Okay. Is there a way to explain that? No, it's not. There's no I don't way. Know this, I don't know this lady. <clears throat> Sorry. That's uh, Valerie McCordy. Okay. Mm -mm. Think about it. Think hard. This is very, ser very, very serious. I mean, you're telling me you watch these shows. I mean, it's I like we put your name out of a hat. No, I don't know her. <clears throat> okay. 2002. This young lady was then. Do you recognize her? No, I don't. Princess. Um, you've never seen, never seen her before? Mm -mm. No. Mr. Franklin, we're, we're, we're both old guys. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sitting here and, uh, <coughs> you know, I'm, I'm ready to answer questions of you. Right. I'm, I'm being up front with you. And, uh, and, this, and by you telling me that you don't know these people or hadn't know any way that your DNA got on their bodies, no. You're insulting my intelligence. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. I do not know. Okay. In 1988, this young lady, Alicia Alexander, was found. 
And again, my it's, all, DNA it's all linked to you. Now, Mr. Franker, I mean, you watch these shows. You tell me once, you know, maybe you met the gal and you had a little relationship with her and she turns up dead. You know, or maybe a coincidence. I just showed you four people. Four people. I mean, your coincidences are getting pretty slim. Wouldn't you say? Yes, sir. I mean, well, I mean, what do you? I mean, do you have anything uh, to say? I mean, no, I don't. I don't know the people. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, how would your DNA get there? What logical reason? I don't. I have no clue. No clue. I mean, I have no clue how my DNA would get there. This young lady, Lucretia Jefferson. No. I don't know her. Again. Coincidence? My DNA. I have no idea. Let me ask you something. Do you, uh, do you know what DNA is? Yes, the blood, saliva. Anything, okay. any body fluids they make contact. Okay, and it's 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 like a fingerprint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, only one person has that DNA. Okay, so you you understand it probably better than I do. By food right there on uh, right there one block before you get the gauge, just a little Mexican spot I get food at. Well, the church isn't there anymore, but uh, yeah. years ago it was there. But uh, I'm I'm just personally I'm very uh, impressed of your of your knowledge of the DNA that it's saliva and blood and it's mm -hmm. only only connects to one person in the world and uh, I mean even even your uh, your kids don't have your DNA you know, they right. might have your blood type or something but they don't have your DNA that's just like they don't have your thumbprint it's only mr. Lonnie Franklin that has mm -hmm. the DNA makeup that's found on those young ladies right there so how in God's name is that possible I don't know no, no thoughts. I mean, do you? Okay, all right. Great. This young lady here, Mary Lowe, was her name. Yeah, no, I don't know her. She looked like um, girl of in um, Rialto, one of my wife's friends. Hmm. But her name is. Uh, Her name is. Damn, she is called two weeks ago. I can't. They come to me. But I don't know her. Okay. But she is favorite, the same facial. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another one. This young lady here, her name is Bernita Sparks. Wow, she looked heavy, said. <laughs> Why? No, I just said she looked fat. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You ever own any weapons? Yes. What kind of weapons? I have a 22 long rifle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, 38 revolver. Okay, what else? Uh... I got a, well, I had a nine millimeter. Nine millimeter? Mm hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other handgun? Mm -hmm. 22 pistol, 22 revolver. 22 revolver? Mm -hmm. that, that's different than the long rifle you mentioned? Yes, it is. Did you purchase those in gun shops or did you get them on the street? I purchased a couple of my gun shops, gun shows. At gun shows mm -hmm. and gun shops. Okay. What, what, Western, what, Western Surplus was down the street. I bought a, oh. uh, I bought one. It should be on record. I bought one there. For the 22 long rifle? Yeah. Okay. And then you said the 9 millimeter? Mm hmm Where'd you get that? The 9 millimeter. I sold it, but I got it out of Texas. So okay. So you no longer have that gun? No, no. And you mentioned the 38? 38 revolver. Okay. Where'd you purchase that one at? I think I got it from my dad. From your dad? Mm-hmm. And is there yeah, it was, the house it was stolen. No, it, it was stolen. stolen. It was stolen. I was. It was broken into. House was broken into some years ago. Oh, okay. And it got, it got stolen. Do you remember when that was stolen? 
she was still with the car in 88, but they broke into the house in 91. 91. Mm. That's a 38 revolver? Mm. I lost two guns. I lost two guns. Okay, what was the other gun? <clears throat> a 22 pistol. The 22 pistol. That's it's different it's from the long one. Right. That you're talking about the revolver. Right. It was a little, little you can see it right here in your pocket. Okay. Yeah, 22 well, revolver. And the 22 long rifle, that's what, a semi? I mean, could you it's a Ruger. It was a Ruger. So it's like a semi auto? Yeah. I guess a Ruger. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, mm -hmm. that's why I'm just trying to make the distinction there. Mm -hmm. and, um, so that's all the handguns you own? That's it. You don't own any more handguns? No more. What about that 25 caliber there in your closet? 25 caliber? Was a rifle? No. Twenty-five caliber. It's a twenty-five caliber. A pistol. Mm-hmm. Yeah, over the. Sh that's not mine. It's not. No, that's my brother-in-law's. Um, Delroy Lino. He has two. I have two things of his. He got evicted. Uh, we just picked up his stuff last last week. What was the other thing you got? What? Well, what was the other thing that you got? You said you picked up two things? Oh, the shotgun. Where is that at in the house? That was in, the in my closet. closet. In mm -hmm. the same closet? Mm-hmm. Okay. You don't own any other handguns? Mm -hmm. Young lady here. Her name is Barbara Ware. <coughs> Never saw her before. The detective attempts to use silence to non verbally indicate that he wants to hear more from the suspect, preferably a confession. However, as Franklin is saying very little at this point, Anything of use is an improvement. Mm -hmm. No, nothing about it. Nothing about it. Sorry, I yeah, don't. Again, you know, it's like I told you earlier. I mean, I'm really feeling insulted here because all of these people. And it's like I told you earlier. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, come on, we're grown men here. I'm not playing games with you. I'm laying my cards right here on the table, just like this. Maybe one, I'd say, okay. Two, I wouldn't be going to Vegas if I were you, because your luck isn't that good. <laughs> but look at all of these. Your luck is running out fast. And unless you come up with some kind of ex explanation. I mean, I'm not hiding anything from you. I'm telling you straight up, straight up. This young lady, her name is Henrietta Wright. Go ahead, take a close look. No, no, no recollection at all. No recollection, or you just don't. I don't know her. I don't know her. But ugly, I don't, I don't know her. So what? <laughs> but ugly, I don't know her. Mm. Mm. Sorry, I don't know her. Surely, Deborah Jackson. <clears throat> so if I told you you were connected to the deaths of all of these ladies, who do you think Detective Kilcoin and I would be sitting here looking at? Huh? Mm -hmm. You don't know who we'd be looking at? Oh, okay. You're looking at me. <laughs> You're looking at me. Yeah. I mean, do you? I mean, do you agree? Yeah, I, mean, I agree with you. I agree with you on that. Yes. I mean. Uh, I mean, all of these people that you say you don't know through scientific evidence are all pointing the finger at Lonnie David Franklin 
Jr. Sit there and look at their faces, all staring at you, pointing that finger at you. Don't insult my intelligence. Don't Please insult. don't insult. I'm gray-haired. I'm going bald. I'm getting close to the end here. I've done this a lot. Okay, just like you. You've been around. I respect your experience. You're probably the best mechanic uh, there is out there. You're good at what you do. And we've been doing this for a long time, too. You wouldn't be here if we weren't absolutely convinced that you did these to these young ladies. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive due to this case's graphic nature. We require extreme caution for children under 13. On August 30th, 1952, Franklin was born. He grew up in South Central Los Angeles. He is a married person and had two children. He was given a general discharge from the United States Army on July 24, 1975. Grim Sleeper is the nickname for convicted serial killer Lonnie David Franklin Jr. Responsible for at least 10 murders and one attempted murder in Los Angeles, California. The attacker was dubbed the Grim Sleeper because he has taken a 14-year break from his crimes from 1988 to 2002. In July 2010, Franklin was arrested as a suspect, and, after many delays, his trial began in February 2016. On May 5, 2016, the jury convicted him of killing nine women and one teenage girl. On June. 6, 2016, the jury recommended the death sentence. On August 10, 2016, Los Angeles Superior Court sentenced him to death for each of the ten victims named in the verdict. After police discovered several dead women in alleyways and dumpsters in South Los Angeles, California, during the mid-1980s, Police began investigating the murders setting up the Southside Slayer Task Force. At the time, the law thought that the murders were committed by one person labeled the Southside Slayer. These crimes were announced to the public on September 23, 1985. Eventually, the LAPD and the sheriff's detectives realized that several serial killers were murdering women. It was a difficult task for the detectives to decide which murders were linked. Amongst their other murders, Louis Crane and Daniel Lee Siebert committed at least two of the murders each, and Yvon Hill and Michael Hughes at least one each. A separate series of killings commenced with the murder of Deborah Jackson, with a different Missouri involving a firearm. These became known, misleadingly, like the Strawberry Murders. Two decades later, the perpetrator of these crimes was named Grim Sleeper due to a long period of apparent inactivity between crimes. In May 2007, the murder of Yanesha Peters was linked through DNA analysis to 11, possibly 12, unsolved murders in Los Angeles, the first of which occurred in 1985. The 800 Task Force was then formed consisting of seven detectives. After a four-month investigation, the LA Weekly investigative reporter Christine Pelisic broke the secret 800 task force news. The linking of Peter's killing to a string of murders going back 23 years, and the fact that an police chief had been silent on the killer's existence. The mayor and chief never issued a press release nor warned the South Los Angeles community of the killer's continuing activities. In some cases, the alternative newspaper was the first to inform the families that their daughters had long been confirmed as serial killer victims. In March 2009, Christine Pelisek of the LA Weekly did an extensive interview with Anitra Washington, the sole survivor of the Grim Sleeper's attacks. She described him as a black man in his early 30s he looked neat, tidy, kind of geeky. He wore a black polo shirt tucked into khaki trousers. She also described him as a thin, neat, 
polite and well-groomed African-American guy. He owned an orange Ford Pinto with a white racing stripe on the hood. T looked like a Hot Wheels car. He offered her a ride. After she refused, he told me, that is what is wrong with you black women. After some banter back and forth, she got into his car. She was impressed by the car's interior. The gear shift handle was memorable, pimped out with a ping-pong sized marble ball. The inside was all white, with white diamond patterned upholstery. When she mentioned a party, he deftly invited himself, and she said he was welcome to come. He then said that he needed to stop briefly at his uncle's house, they wound through residential roads in his sporty car, ending up on a street whose name she did not take note of. The polite stranger parked outside a mustard-colored house partially obscured by hedges, got out, walked up to the house, briefly talked to someone inside, and returned about ten minutes later. They began arguing when he suddenly pulled a small handgun out of a pocket on the driver's side of the Pinto, and shot her in the chest as he drove along the residential streets. The killer apparently documented his attacks with a Polaroid camera, she blacked out, but was startled awake by the bright flash of the camera. The man had taken her picture and sexually assaulted her. She remembers grabbing at him, and the two struggled. She pleaded to be taken to a hospital. He refused. Despite her half-conscious condition, she's almost certain he told her he couldn't take her to a hospital because he didn't want to get caught. In late August 2008, the same week The Weekly broke the sole survivor's story with information on the Grim Sleeper's body count of 13 victims, an aide to police chief said he was too busy to comment on the case. An elusive serial killer, linked to 10 slayings in South Los Angeles and Inglewood over nearly two decades, resurfaced early last year to kill again, long periods between known killings and a disjointed, often dormant investigation that spanned different generations of detectives left police unclear for years that a single man was behind the slayings. The latest slaying was tied conclusively to the others by DNA analysis in May 2007. The day those tests came in, we realized we had a serial killer on our hands who has been active for 23 years, Dennis Kilcoyne, who heads a task force of seven detectives charged with solving the killings. Detectives said, except for one black man, the killer has targeted young black women. He sexually abused the women and left almost all of their bodies in a corridor along Western Avenue in South Los Angeles, often in alleys. Detectives suspect that most of the women were working as prostitutes at the time they were killed. Kilcoyne and his team have been working quietly, trying to breathe life into the investigation without tipping off the killer. They have retraced cold leads and are collaborating with state officials on an exhaustive search of prison records. Detectives have begun examining nearly three dozen other cases that bear similarities to serial killers' slings. The latest killing was reported in August 2008 by the All. A Weekly. The first known slaying occurred in 1985 when 29-year-old Deborah Jackson was shot three times in the chest. Her body was left in an alley near West Gage Avenue. It was a particularly dark period for the city when widespread cocaine use, rampant crime, and vicious killings were rife in South LA three years past before police realized that something larger was occurring when ballistics tests showed that the same handgun used to kill Jackson had been used in seven other killings. Detectives handling the investigation were stymied. In late 1988, the killer shot a woman in the chest with the same gun, sexually assaulted her, and left her for dead. She survived, giving police their first, albeit vague, description of the man as an African-American in his mid-thirties. She also described his car in orange Ford Pinto. The new information led detectives to pull registration records on every Pinto in Los Angeles County, 
Kilcoyne said, but the search led nowhere. Then the trail went cold. For about 13 years, no new deaths were linked to the killer. Kilcoyne said of the detectives working the case, everything dried up. They ran out of clues. They got on to other things the topics got moved further and further back on the shelf. The killer had been all but forgotten until a few years ago when recently developed DNA analysis technology made it clear he was still killing. In 2001, LAPD detectives under the direction of police chief Bernard C. Parks began delving into the thousands of unsolved cases built up over the years. In 2004, debt. Cliff Shepard was poring over old murder cases from South L. A. He found a preserved DNA sample taken from the body of one of the killer's earlier victims. Analysis of the DNA showed conclusive similarities to samples found on the body of a 35-year-old woman killed in 2003 and 14-year-old Princess Bertha Mew, who was found strangled and beaten in an Inglewood alley in March 2002. But, again, the case faded with detectives no closer to finding the killer. And also, he seemed to disappear with no more killings tied to him. In 2006, an Inglewood detective made headlines when he got a DNA sample from a 65-year-old white inmate who had made incriminating statements about killing prostitute cell A to law enforcement. The tests showed he was not the killer. Then, on the first day of 2007, a homeless man found Yanesha Peters's body on Southwestern Avenue. She had been shot and covered with a garbage bag. When DNA tests linked her killer to the earlier slings, investigator then checked the killer's DNA against a federal DNA database of known criminals but found no matches. One popular theory among detectives was that the killer was in prison during the two distinct periods when no killings were connected to him. Following that lead, Investigators at the California Department of Corrections have been working with the LAPD task force to sort through a list of about 50,000 inmates from Los Angeles County. The latter were convicted of violent crimes during one of those periods and do not have DNA samples on record. The two agencies are filtering the lists in search of men in prison during both periods of the killer's apparent inactivity. But Kilcoyne said the killer may have just avoided detection and committed crimes that have not been connected to him. We cannot be so arrogant to think that everything this guy has ever done came with an LAPD crime report attached to it. The task force has identified 33 old LAPD cases that have similarities to the killings and have begun the painstaking process of reviewing them. Task force members also automatically receive alerts when other LAPD detectives or uniformed cops report a homicide involving females found outdoors. They have visited more than 15 crime scenes, but none have had the marks of the suspect they are looking for. One promising route the LAPD has not yet been able to try is comparing the serial killer's DNA with samples in the criminal database searching for one of his close relatives. The familial searches can be done, but only with Attorney General Jerry Brown's permission. The technique is controversial, with critics calling it an invasion of privacy. A spokesperson for Brown declined to comment on whether or when Brown would approve a familial search on this case. A sweep of state prisons in 2008 failed to come up with the killer or anyone related to him. However, a second familial search of prisons had come up with a convict whose DNA indicated that he was a close relative of the serial killer suspected of killing at least 10 women. Working through the 4th of July weekend, LAPD detectives drew up a family tree of the prisoner, then began analyzing all the men on it. Were they the right age? Did they live near the murder scenes? Was there anything in their background to explain why the serial killer had apparently stopped killing for 13 years, then resumed in 2003? 
according to LAPD officials who requested anonymity from that painstaking process, the prisoner's father emerged as a likely suspect. An undercover team was sent to follow him. They retrieved a discarded pizza slice to analyze his DNA. On Tuesday, they confirmed that it matched the DNA of the suspect in the killings. On Wednesday, police went to the South LA home of Lonnie David Franklin Jr. and arrested him without incident. Franklin is charged with 10 counts of murder in Deborah Jackson, 29-year-old Henrietta Wright, 35-year-old Barbara Ware, 23-year-old Bernita Sparks, Mary Lowe, Black Rekha Jefferson, Alicia Alexander, 18-year-old Princess Bertha Mew, 15-year-old Valerie McCurvey, and Yanesha Peters, 25-year-old. He is also charged with one count of attempted murder, apparently stemming from the assault on the only victim known to have survived. As word of the arrest spread across South Los Angeles, neighbors and relatives of the victims began to gather near Franklin's home. A contradictory picture of the suspect emerged. According to city and police sources, Franklin was a garage attendant at the LAPD's 77th Street Division station in the early 1980s. He worked as a garbage collector for the Los Angeles Department of Sanitation during the years that the first eight killings occurred, beginning with Jackson's death on August 10, 1985, and ending with the death of Alexander on Sept. 11, 1988. Franklin has at least four prior convictions, two for felony possession of the stolen property in 1993 and 2003 one for misdemeanor battery in 1997, and one for misdemeanor assault in 1999, according to court records. He was sentenced to a year in jail for the first stolen property charge and 270 days for the second one. On a tidy street of single-family homes in South Los Angeles where Franklin lived for decades, Residents described him as a kind and compassionate neighbor who volunteered in the community. He used to help elderly residents of the block and fixed their cars for free. A very good man. His daughter just graduated from college, we believe. He's a good mechanic, worked out of his garage. I've been here since 1976, that's how long I've known him. I'm not pretty shocked. I'm all the way shocked. In the afternoon, families of grim sleeper victims began arriving on the block. Many of the killings occurred not far from Franklin's home, and the family members said they needed to come to his house to bear witness. She was found on Western and 92nd, in a dumpster, Diane McQueen said as she stood behind the crime tape, clutching a funeral program for her niece Peters the last victim attributed to the serial killer. It hit my family really hard. I had lost hope this day would come. I feel a lot of joy it did at last. I wanted to see what his house looked like, what his neighborhood looked like, the place where he grew up, Donald Alexander, brother of victim Alicia Monique Alexander. It was curiosity. What I found was that it wasn't far from where I grew up. His neighbors looked like the people I see every day. They weren't aliens. And he wasn't hiding in the community. In announcing the arrests, District Attorney Steve Cooley praised the LAPD and the California Department of Justice, which carried out the DNA familial search after Attorney General Jerry Brown approved the use of the relatively new tool. Only California and Colorado have formal policies that permit software to look for DNA profiles of possible relatives of a suspect. This is a daily crime all the time, true crime stories, every day, we dive into the world of unsolved murders and true crime stories. Subscribe and like this video, not to miss any. After years of futility, the LAPD stepped up its investigation of the serial killing case in 2007 when Police Chief Charlie Beck's predecessor, William J. Bratton, formed a task force to work exclusively on the matter. 
With so many years that have passed since the killer first struck and the police only belatedly linking the long string of victims to a single killer, the detective's team was left at a severe disadvantage. Investigators pored over old case files in search of important clues that might have been overlooked. They tried to recreate the seedy, violent world of South Los Angeles in the 1980s that the early victims and killer had inhabited. One after another leads that at first seemed to hold promise dissolved frustratingly into dead ends. But with public pressure mounting, the detectives tried whatever approaches they could, however seemingly far-fetched. They asked undercover vice officers to collect DNA samples from middle-aged African Americans arrested for soliciting prostitutes, hoping to identify a suspect. The entire department was put on notice that members of the task force were to be summoned to homicide scenes that resembled the serial killer's work in any way. Most compelling was a 911 phone call an LAPD operator received in 1987. The caller said he had seen a man dump Ware's body out of the back of a van into an alley and gave the vehicle's license plate before hanging up. On the night of the call, the van was traced back to an out-of-funk church in the area, but detectives at the time failed to pursue the lead aggressively, much to the dismay of debt. Dennis Kilcoyne, who headed the task force. Kilcoyne and his team tried, 20 years later, to breathe life back into the van's investigation. Detectives tracked down about 10 men associated with the church and took DNA samples to test against the suspected killers. A visit to the retired deacon at his home outside of Macon, Ga, turned up nothing, as did a Florida prison visit. The hunt epitomized the agonizing slog the detectives faced day in and day out. In a statement issued by his office, Beck said, we never gave up on this investigation, not for one minute. Our detectives worked relentlessly, following up on every lead they received. Their hard work has resulted in today's apprehension of this vicious killer. I am hopeful that the hard work of these men and women will bring some closure to the families who tragically lost loved ones during the last 23 years. Later, in July, when Los Angeles police arrested Lonnie Franklin Jr., the suspected grim sleeper serial killer, they scoured his South L.A. property for evidence. Among the unsettling discoveries was a cache of about 1,000 photographs and hundreds of hours of home video showing women, many of them partly or fully nude and striking sexually graphic poses. It was an eerie find in a case involving a man who is thought to have sexually assaulted his victims before or after killing them. Police also cannot account for large swaths of Franklin's life, including a 14-year gap between his alleged killings, during which investigators suspect he killed other women. Detectives set out to identify the women on the film and tape, knowing that some could be additional homicide victims. There were several photos of each woman, and police whittled the collection down to 180 images. They believe that about 20 of the pictures show women also captured in the other photographs. For months they slogged through images in missing person databases and coroner records, hoping for lucky matches. The work proved fruitless. With the detectives no closer to identifying the women, Police turned to the public Thursday for help. They released cropped versions of the images that show the women's faces at a news conference, hoping the women themselves, their family members, or acquaintances will recognize them and contact investigators. Police said they were sensitive to the harm and embarrassment the photograph's release could cause women who never told their family or friends about the encounters. In the end, however, they decided that the need to identify the women outweighed the potential harm. For similar reasons, the Times has decided to publish the photographs on its website. Dennis Kilcoyne said, As a police department, we must account for the welfare of these women. 
We're trying to fill in the life and times of Lonnie Franklin over the past 30 years, and talking to people is a big part of that. These are obviously women who had a conversation or two with this guy. I won't be surprised if we find some of them were his victims. Police have employed the strategy before in other high-profile serial cases. Most notably, investigators went public earlier this year with a trove of photographs of women and girls taken by killer Rodney James Alcala. But with Alcala's and some other similar cases, police waited until after the killers had been convicted before releasing images. LAPD officials decided they could not wait. With little known about Franklin, they hope the women will provide answers that have so far eluded detectives. The question of the day is, why? What was he doing to get these women to do this sort of stuff on film? Typically, people use drugs as leverage, but we didn't find one iota of evidence that he was into that. Franklin is accused of murdering ten women and attempting to kill another who survived. Authorities say they have linked Franklin to the killings through a combination of DNA and ballistics evidence. The formal city sanitation worker and LAPD garage attendant has pleaded not guilty and remains in custody. Louisa Pensanti, Franklin's attorney, expressed concern about the photograph's release, saying prosecutors have not yet provided her with copies of the images as part of the legal proceedings. She added that the move will make it difficult for Franklin to receive a fair trial. Pendant said, I think it's proper that they tried to find out everything they need to, but to do it now, and in this way, will taint the jury pool. The photograph's discovery came at the end of a long, frustrating search for the killer, whom the LA Weekly dubbed the grim sleeper for the long stretch between killings. The killer's first known slaying occurred in the summer of 1985 when a 29-year-old woman was shot three times in the chest and her body left in an alley near West Gage Avenue, police said. Three years passed before ballistics tests alerted police that the same handgun used to kill the first woman had been used in seven other killings. The case went cold until 2004, when DNA testing linked the earlier killings to genetic evidence found on the body of a 14-year-old girl found strangled and beaten in an Inglewood alley in March 2002 and a woman killed in 2003. Then, in January 2007, DNA tests linked the killer to another woman's slaying. The killer's DNA profile did not match any of the millions taken from convicted felons and arrestees kept in law enforcement databases. Kilcoyne and half a dozen detectives painstakingly tried to track down prostitutes, drug dealers, and pimps who were active in the area during both periods of killings, hoping someone would be able to lead them to the killer. Several tantalizing leads went nowhere. The break came this summer when a new, controversial form of DNA matching searched for potential relatives of the killer led detectives to Franklin's son. Undercover officers trailed Franklin for days until they surreptitiously collected a DNA sample that, police said, tied Franklin to the killings. Authorities combed his house in a garage, vehicles, and a trailer in the backyard, finding most of the photos in the trailer. The people in the images appear to span a wide range of ages, from teenagers to women in their 40s or older. Many of the subjects are smiling. In some, however, the women appear dead, heavily drugged, or asleep. Steve Katz, co-executive producer of the TV show America's Most Wanted, said Thursday that police have long been releasing photos of possible victims of crimes. The reach of the internet has made the strategy more effective. In days gone by, it would be a local story, maybe picked up by the national networks, it was difficult to get those pictures out in front of a wide audience. In 2008, Los Angeles County Sheriff's homicide investigators released pictures of 47 women.
The photos had been taken in the 1980s by William Bradford, a professional photographer. He was convicted in 1987 of the slayings of two models. In the two weeks after the release of the images, sheriff's officials fielded more than 2,000 calls from around the country and Europe. Most of the women or family members confirmed the photo's subjects were alive. However, investigators could not account for about a dozen of them and believe strongly they may have been murdered. In the Alcala case, detectives seized hundreds of images from a storage locker the convicted killer rented but waited three decades to release them as prosecutors struggled through several trials for a conviction. Surprisingly, detectives have already fielded a wave of phone calls in the Grim Sleeper case. After Franklin's arrest, family and friends of about 75 missing women called, wanting to know if he could have been responsible for their disappearances. Detectives were able to dismiss Franklin as a suspect in most cases, but are pursuing the possibility that he's tied to a handful of them. Latterly that summer, police had tied Loney Franklin Jr. to the killings of 10 women in South LA during a period that spanned more than two decades. More work, however, was needed to answer the troubling questions that remained, had he killed others? If so, how many? Who were they? On Tuesday, after months spent combing through dozens of unsolved homicide files, countless missing person reports, and eerie photographs of women found at Franklin's residence, police went public with suspicions that eight additional women may have been his victims. Franklin, 58, was indicted by a grand jury last month in the 10 slayings to which police say he is linked through a combination of DNA and ballistics evidence. Franklin has pleaded not guilty and remains in custody awaiting trial. He is accused of killing seven women between 1985 and 1988 and three between 2002 and 2007 earning him the Grim Sleeper moniker from the LA Weekly newspaper because of what appeared to be a period of inactivity separating the killings. Throughout the investigation, however, police have been openly skeptical of the idea that the slaying stopped during the 13-year gap. It was far more likely that Franklin killed others who were not linked to him or whose bodies were never recovered. He targeted women on the margins of society many of them drug addicts and occasional prostitutes. Moreover, the bodies of several of his suspected victims were found in trash bins, and Franklin worked as a garbage collector in the 1980s, raising the prospect that bodies of other victims could have been dumped in landfills and never found. Two of the eight women discussed Tuesday disappeared during the 13 years. A third went missing in 1982, before the first of the ten known killings. And no physical evidence implicates Franklin in any wrongdoing related to the eight additional women. By going public, they hope people with information about the women will come forward either to eliminate them as potential victims or help confirm the detectives' fears. Of the eight women discussed, three are of particular concern, I. Ella Marshall a high school senior when she disappeared in 2005. Brolinia Morris, a 25-year-old who was reported missing in 2005. And an unidentified woman whose photograph was found at Franklin's residence when he was arrested. Police discovered Marshall's Hawthorne High School identification card, Morris Nevada driver's license and photos of Morris in compromising positions, and a picture of the unidentified woman in a refrigerator in Franklin's garage, in the fridge. Police also found Yanesha Peters' photos, one of the ten women Franklin is accused of killing, and a photograph of another person. Still, that one was too dark to be of any use in the investigation. Kilcoin said investigators fear the cache of items and images found in the refrigerator was of special significance to Franklin because he kept it separate from photographs of scores of other women found elsewhere in his residence, which he shared with his wife. Police have said Franklin's wife has refused to talk to them. 
We hope for the best, we wish nothing more than to find them alive and well, but the circumstances are gloomy. Besides, the families of four other missing women approached police after Franklin's arrest, concerned about the possibility that they were victims. Those women, according to Kilcoin, lived lifestyles similar to those of the confirmed victims, including drug use and occasional prostitution. They also were known to frequent Franklin's South LA neighborhood at the time they disappeared. Also, detectives believe Inez Warren, who was killed in 1988, may have been a victim of Franklin because her killing has similarities. Like many of Franklin's suspected victims, Warren was known to use drugs and occasionally turn to prostitution. Her body was found in an alley off Western Avenue with a single gunshot wound to the chest from a small caliber handgun. Detectives had previously suspected Franklin in another unsolved murder but have since dismissed the possibility on Tuesday. Kilcoin once again displayed 55 still photos of women found at Franklin's home. They were part of a more extensive collection of images that police released to the public in hopes of identifying the women and tracking them down or adding them to the list of possible victims. Another victim's body was found in February 2006. Deborah Jackson, a 29-year-old waitress, was discovered shot in the chest three decades ago in an alley. The body of Yanesha Peters was found in a dumpster in 2007. There were at least eight other women. And one who got away. They were young and black and leading troubled lives. Most were killed along a corridor in the Manchester Square neighborhood of South Los Angeles. Each was initially labeled Jane Doe. Police kept the cases quiet a decision that later led to outrage over what seemed a disregard for the victims and the community's safety. The slayings were eventually linked to a serial killer, dubbed the Grim Sleeper. When affable Lonnie Franklin Jr., a former Los Angeles police garage attendant and city garbage collector, was arrested in the case in 2010, it shocked residents. Still, it signaled a crucial moment in the search for justice for a region that has often felt marginalized when solving homicides. Franklin's capital murder trial began in a downtown Los Angeles courtroom. District Attorney Beth Silverman told jurors the victims were especially vulnerable to someone who knew the South Los Angeles streets and alleys by heart. When crack cocaine was devastating the community, Franklin had preyed on susceptible women, some of whom worked as prostitutes, luring them into the isolation of his car with the promise of drugs, all but one tested positive for narcotics. Their bodies were later dumped like trash. As she spoke, gruesome photos were projected onto a screen, Valerie McCurvey's half-naked body left in the street, ligature marks etched into the 35-year-old's neck. Peters folded into a fetal position, her head and hands seen through a hole in a black garbage bag. Alicia Alexander, found nude and underneath the mattress in an alley. The images elicited gasps and whimpers from courtroom spectators. A woman covered her eyes and collapsed into the man beside her, who buried his head in his hands. Franklin, wearing a blue button-down shirt and tie, stared ahead, never turning to look at the photos. Silverman said jurors at one point will view the video of Franklin's interrogation by police. Pay close attention to his body language and his conduct during that interview process as he laughs and makes light of the photos of the dead women lying on the table in front of him, she said. Franklin's home search resulted in 800 items of evidence, including 10 guns, one of which matched the bullet that struck Peters in the spine. A photo of Peters, her breast exposed, was found in a refrigerator in Franklin's garage. The defense declined to give an opening statement but will have the opportunity to do so after the prosecution rests. 
The controversial DNA evidence that pointed to Franklin will probably be argued at length between a prosecutor and a defense attorney whose interactions at earlier hearings had been contentious. Hundreds of potential jurors warned that the case may take about three months and possibly feature more than 400 witnesses were asked their thoughts on DNA analysis. In 2008, officials collected DNA data from state prisoners, hoping for a grim sleeper hit. Nothing turned up. A year later, then-State Attorney General Jerry Brown approved a new technique that allowed officials to check whether a crime suspect's DNA partially matches anyone in the state's offender DNA database. The familial search for the Grim Sleeper came up with a name, Christopher Franklin. Arrested in 2008 and charged with firearm and drug offenses, he had been required to submit his DNA. His father was Loney Franklin. Police focused on the elder Franklin, telling him to ensure he was a DNA match. A detective posing as a busboy at a restaurant collected a discarded pizza crust, fork, napkin, drinking glass, and cake crumbs. Franklin's attorneys said that an expert hired by their team had determined that DNA collected from two crime scenes linked to their client matched convicted serial killer Chester Turner. The judge ruled that their expert wasn't qualified to testify. In court papers, the defense also listed more than a dozen other men as potential DNA sources found at crime scenes tied to Franklin. Turner convicted of killing 14 women, many of whom were found in an area straddling Figueroa Street was among a handful of serial killers in Los Angeles County targeting women during the 1980s and 1990s at the height of crack cocaine epidemic. Ivan J. Hill, known as the 60 Freeway Slayer, strangled women in the San Gabriel Valley. Hughes targeted women who had drug problems dumping three of them in a commercial area of Culver City. Samuel Little choked his victims, leaving their bodies in alleyways or abandoned garages. However, the Grim Sleeper has been called the most enduring serial killer of the group, continuing to kill for decades. It's a distinction that angers many who attribute the murders to indifference toward the victims. It's been wrenching for the families, demoralizing for the community, she has pushed for more than two decades for authorities to be more aggressive. Prescode said, everybody remembers the young blonde who was killed in Aruba, and rightly they should, but meanwhile, you have all these women in South LA they're considered the riffraff of society. She added that Anitra Washington, the lone survivor who escaped as a 30-year-old in 1988, didn't know for two decades that she had encountered a possible serial killer. Prescode, who advocates for victims' families, also said the women's line of work and drug problems should be de-emphasized. That doesn't mean they should be killed, that their lives should be devalued. Franklin faces 10 counts of murder and attempted murder, but investigators suspect that he is responsible for additional deaths. LAPD detectives had continued to search for victims after Franklin's arrest, publicly releasing photos of unidentified women found inside his home. After reviewing hundreds of unsolved homicides and missing person reports, they announced in 2011 that they had traced six more killings to Franklin. By then, the complicated case was moving sluggishly toward trial. In a strategic decision, Police decided against seeking additional charges out of fear it would lead to even more delays. For those who have sat through numerous court proceedings over the last five years, the first day of testimony was about progress and pain. After court ended, Porter Alexander strolled down the hallway, struggling to speak about the daughter found dead at 18 and the horrible images that had been displayed. To sit there and see all the trauma that those young girls endured, he said. I don't have the words. In another case that occurred on August 10, 20, 
16, a man approached Laura Moore at a bus stop in the spring of 1984 and offered a warning, you shouldn't be out here alone. Bad guys will pick you up, he told her. Let me take you where you have to go. Moore, then 21 years old, agreed reluctantly. As the man drove off, he told her to put on her seat belt. When she refused, he reached under his seat, grabbed a gun, and shot her six times. Wounded, she managed to escape but turned back to study his face. That man was Lonnie David Franklin Jr., now better known as the Grim Sleeper serial killer. She recounted the story in court Wednesday at a hearing where Franklin was sentenced to death, capping a lengthy legal saga that centered on the gruesome killings of more than a dozen women in South Hill. A Superior Court Judge Kathleen Kennedy told Franklin his relatives of his victims look on, some of them in tears. This is not a sentence of vengeance, it's justice. Franklin, 63 years old, was convicted earlier this year of killing nine women and a teenage girl from 1985 to 2007. During the penalty phase of his trial, prosecutors connected him to several additional slayings. Detectives believe he may have killed at least 25 women. The judge read the names of the 10 victims Franklin was found guilty of killing. In each case, Kennedy told him, you shall suffer the death penalty. As she spoke, some of the victims' relatives cried, others sighed. One man repeated, Amen, Amen, Amen. The sentence came toward the end of an emotional hearing where more than a dozen family members and friends of victims read statements. Many of them were repeatedly asking why Franklin chose to attack members of his own community. The defendant took my daughter, murdered her, put her in a plastic bag a trash bag like she was trash. Laverne Peters, whose 25-year-old daughter was found in a garbage bin in 2007 told the court before Franklin was sentenced. My hope is that he spends the rest of his glory days in his jail cell, which will become his trash bag. Five of the jurors who convicted Franklin attended, occasionally nodding. Before the hearing, one of the victim's sisters thanked the juror and said, God bless you. During the hearing, a woman spoke of losing her best friend, but said she still hears her voice in dreams. A victim's uncle said he remembered how loudly she used to cry when he babysat her as a child. At one point, the nephew of Henry Wright, whose body was found under a mattress in an alleyway in 1986, addressed Franklin directly, saying, You're a cold-hearted dude. Franklin nodded slightly. When Moore, the surviving victim, addressed Franklin, her body began to shake. Why? 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 She asked. Really? Why? Moore wasn't listed in the criminal complaint against Franklin. Still, Los Angeles police Darren Dupree that investigated the Grim Sleeper killing said he is very confident that she is one of his victims. Franklin sat stoically as Kennedy sentenced him just as he had throughout the trial. But earlier in the morning, he did react to statements delivered by some of the victim's relatives. Mary Alexander, whose 18-year-old daughter was murdered, spoke directly to Franklin. She said, I'd like for Mr. Franklin to turn around and face me. Franklin turned his head slowly, locking eyes with Alexander. I'd like to know, why? Alexander asked, gripping the podium. Franklin whispered something in response. She repeated her question, louder, why? Again, he whispered. I know she didn't do anything to hurt you, Alexander told Franklin, I know that. Franklin's face softened, and he nodded. Alexander told Franklin that she had thought a lot about forgiveness, but said she was finding the concept extremely difficult. Alexander said, I'm still battling that. Franklin nodded once more and turned back toward the judge. When another victim's sister told Franklin that she recognized him, he got angry, shouting, 
That's a bald-faced lie. In imposing the sentence, Kennedy said she had struggled throughout the case to understand what motivated Franklin. She said, it doesn't matter why, there could never be a justification for what you have done. The killer, one of California's most prolific, targeted victims, who were generally young, vulnerable, and, at times, ignored. The attacks failed to raise alarms the way other famous serial slayings by killers such as the Hillside Strangler or the Night Stalker did. The deaths in the mid to late 80s coincided with a surge in slayings linked to the crack cocaine epidemic. Besides, several other serial killers were operating in the same area in those years. Michael Hughes was convicted of killing seven women, Chester Turner of 14 women in a fetus. Both are on California's death row. But the Grim Sleeper proved to be the most persistent. He targeted women who were drug addicts or prostitutes and often dumped their naked bodies alongside roads or in the trash. Many of the women were initially listed as Jane Does. The deaths drew little, if any, media attention. Police kept the slayings quiet despite suspicions that a serial killer was stalking black women. This decision led to outrage and condemnation from many who attribute Franklin's longevity as a killer to police indifference. Authorities could link the slayings through ballistic and genetic evidence at the crime scenes that pointed to a single killer. But identifying the DNA proved difficult. A break finally came in the case in 2010, when a search of state offender records turned up a partial match. The person wasn't the suspected serial killer, but a close relative was. Before long, investigators focused on the convict's father, Franklin. After telling him to a pizza joint in Buna Park during the summer of 2010, police collected a partially eaten pizza slice. They tested it for DNA and, finally, had a match. A search of Franklin's home on 81st Street not far from the South LA Quarter where many of the victims' bodies were found turned up a .25 caliber semi-automatic handgun. Two criminalists testified at trial that it was the same weapon that killed one of the victims. Franklin's attorney, Seymour Amster, told jurors that DNA from other men was found at some crime scenes a sign, he said, that someone else could have played a role in the slayings. In May, a jury convicted Franklin of 10 counts of murder. His victims, in order of death, were Deborah Jackson, 29-year-old, Henrietta Wright, 35-year-old, Barbara Ware, 23-year-old, Bernita Sparks, 25-year-old, Mary Lowe, 26-year-old, Lackrecka Jefferson, 22-year-old, Alicia Alexander, 18-year-old, Princess Bertha Mew, 15-year-old, Valerie McCurvey, 35-year-old, and Yanesha Peters, 25-year-old. Franklin was also convicted of attempted murder connected with an attack on Anita Washington who survived and testified against him. Washington told Franklin, You're truly a piece of evil. You're a Satan representative. You're right up there with Manson. Franklin initially earned the Grim Sleeper nickname because a gap in the killings between 1988 and 2002 suggested he had gone dormant. But detectives believe Franklin never really slept. After the initial conviction, Prosecutors presented more evidence against Franklin during the penalty phase of the trial. As a U.S. Army private stationed abroad, a woman testified that Franklin was one of three assailants who gang-raped her in Germany in 1974. The high-stakes trial devolved at times into bitter back and forths between attorneys, and the discord continued Wednesday. And before the sentencing, Amster made two last-ditch efforts to keep his client off death row. Kennedy quickly shot down a motion for a new trial based on allegations of prosecutorial misconduct as well as an activity calling for a sentence of life without parole instead of death. 
After the sentencing, Amster released a written statement decrying the death penalty in California as a pointless waste of tax dollars. Amster said in the statement, considering the outcomes are often the same since the inmates will almost certainly die from causes other than execution. The only significant difference is the millions of dollars wasted on a death verdict. California's death penalty has been the subject of intense legal battles in recent years. There are 746 people on California's death row, and no one has been executed in the state since 2006. There might be a lot more victims. We don't even know. Because upon his arrest in 2010, Franklin's home was searched, and detectives took nearly 1,000 photos of women and teenage girls. Some nude, unconscious, bleeding, some presumably dead, into evidence. After identifying the known victims, police wondered if there were more murders tied to the grim sleeper. At a press conference last spring, police chief Charlie Beck told reporters, we certainly don't believe we are so lucky or so good as to know all of his victims. We need the public's help. It's common for serial killers to take breaks between killings, but at least in his case, a 14-year gap does not seem likely. Though not charged for his murder, police believe Franklin is responsible for the death of Thomas Steele. The latter was assumed to be the friend of one of Franklin's victims and anywhere from 14 to 100 unsolved murders of Jane does. Franklin maintains his innocence in all charges against him, so DNA and witnesses may be the only means to solve these crimes. Investigations are ongoing, and detectives speculate whether Franklin was hiding after the botched murder of Washington in 1988. And if anyone could cover up a dead body, Franklin, as a sanitation worker for the city, had access to landfills. Led officials to speculate that he could have disposed of any number of bodies undetected. Regardless of what is to follow with the other investigations, Franklin is the last in a line of nearly 750 inmates on death row at San Quentin State Prison. No one has been put to death since 2006. His conviction will automatically be appealed, a right afforded to anyone sentenced to death. Still, it's safe to assume that Franklin will live out his life in jail and not go on to kill again. Last but not least, the trial was delayed several times and opened on Feb. 16, 2016. Closing arguments began May 2, 2016, and the jury began deliberating May 4, 2016. The jury convicted Franklin on all counts on May 5, 2016. On June 6, 2016, the jury recommended that Franklin be sentenced to death. On August 10, the Superior Court sentenced Franklin on each count naming the individual victims.